Hi, everybody. Hi, Hi everyone. Good morning. Our Sunday mornings and joining into our junior wickle um, in conversation with this is the first in conversation with session so no pressure it needs to be good. Ah. Um, thank you so much for giving up your Sunday mornings today we are talking about um, how to jump the next career hurdle or as Pippa eloquently put it hummit the next uh, hurdle the next summit so who knows nothing like a mixed metaphor <laughs> I am Chloe Birch I'm currently a just second six pupil um, at Carmelite Chambers. Um, it's been a delightful time to get on one's feet. Um, before that, I was a paralegal um, and also a police station rep, um, so a bit of both there. Hi, I'm Annika Thiraraja. I'm a trainee solicitor at Hodge Jones and Allen, and I'm currently doing my second seat in civil liberties. Uh, before that, my first seat was in crime, and I was a paralegal in crime, and I worked as a crime support paralegal before that as well. In cry. Hi, um, my name is Grace King. I'm a pupil at Full Brooms Buildings, um, specialising in crime. Prior to that, I was a paralegal at a general um, crime firm back in County Durham, and then I moved to London, and I was a paralegal at a white collar crime firm in London. Hi, um, I'm Leona Roberts. I'm an associate solicitor at Slater and Gordon. Before that, I um, trained. Uh, as a as training solicitor for two years and qualified in April 2023. Hi, um, I am currently a trainee solicitor at a criminal defence firm. Um, prior to that, I was a paralegal for the CPS. Um, I also paralegaled at the firm I'm at now and I'm a police station rep too. Uh, I'm Pippa Woodrow. I'm a tenant at Doughty Street Chambers. I um, forever ago was um, a law student and paralegal and volunteer at various different places including a law centre uh, and then was a pupil, I was a first six pupil at one set, moved mid 12 months, then took tenancy, then moved set to become a fixed term tenant and then became a tenant again. So, um, lots of hurdles. <laughs> we'll be coming to you for all of the tenancy questions in the world. Um, so, I'm Gemma Rose, um, and I'm a, a junior tenant at Five St Andrews Hill Chambers. And um, before that, I worked as a criminal uh, paralegal um, at a sort of high street London um, solicitors. So, look out if you are trying to be a paralegal because you have got <laughs> at least seven brains. <laughs> Um, Hi, I'm Gillian Houston. I'm currently a paralegal in special crime and counter-terrorism in the Crime Prosecution Service. I'm also on the prosecutor pathway, so I'm doing my LPC part-time at BPP. So my next step is to be a trainee solicitor. I'm Jess Dunk. I'm two years qualified. I am an associate in the White Collar Crime and Government Enforcement team at Ropes and Gray. Uh, before that, I was a paralegal, then trainee, and then a solicitor for about a year doing general crime, and I was a police station ref as well. Brilliant. Well, thank you so, so much. And hopefully this will showcase some of the brilliant junior members that we have at Wickle. Um, and we spend a lot of time doing career development into silk and career development into judicial appointment, which I'm sure will be our next steps for all of us at some point. Um, but actually, what about in the interim? And that's what we'd really like to talk about today. I would like to ask um, Jess about the move between um, the sort of general crime firm that you were in and moving to your jazzy, exciting new American white collar world and, and how you made the leap, why you made the leap. So the leap sort of happened by accident when I was doing my training contract at Summit Mill and Walker, I did a secondment and I met a solicitor there who put me in touch with the uh, amazing lady, Judith Seddon, who is now my uh, the partner uh, in my team at Ropes and Gray. Um, and I just sort of stayed in touch with her. And when an opening came up in her team, um, I went for it. And that's how I that's how I ended up moving. It was never really the plan. I never thought I'd end up in corporate law, but the opportunity came up and I took it. It's, it's definitely been a big adjustment. I've gone from working in a firm with about 25, 30 people maybe. Whereas I think Ropes and Gray globally has about 1700 lawyers. So <laughs> it's definitely been an adjustment. Uh, the area of law is, it is different but the skills are fairly transferable, the things that you learn in general crime 
uh, definitely help you along the way when you're doing white collar work as well. The principles are often very similar. So it's been, it's been an interesting year. Um, but um, yeah, the, the, the work I did at, at Summit Milwaukee definitely stood me in good stead. Do you find, Jess, that um, the clients in particular have a different expectation in now that you're doing white collar work? Mm, yes and no. It, it's not an easy question to answer because one of the biggest differences between the two practices is that when you're in general crime, you get a huge amount of exposure to clients. Uh, whereas when you're in corporate law, client exposure kind of drips down from partner level. So you don't see as much of clients as you do when you're in general crime. I think in lots of ways it's similar. People are people are facing different types of consequences, but people are still facing potentially prison sentences. They're facing losing their jobs, their livelihoods. So on the whole, I, I'd say they can be pretty similar. You don't maybe come across some of the challenges as frequently as you would in general crime. So I'm thinking of things like um, dealing with people that are maybe having a mental health crisis and things like that. But in terms of the stress and the worry and the impact, it's, it's quite similar. In terms of um, dealing with clients, like you say, as and when they're being sentenced to prison sentences and things, that's certainly something that I found as a, a very new baby pupil that is, you know, a, definitely a confidence hurdle that I will have to, to leap. Um, and Gemma or Pippa, I don't know what your experiences are about gaining that confidence as a pupil um, becoming tenant in, in those sorts of cases. Um, well, I think for me, I mean, I'm still working on that confidence. I mean, I've only been um, a tenant for two, a year, two years now. Um, so it's still something that I struggle with. Um, you know, imposter syndrome is all very, very much a reality. Um, but it's just, yeah, practice and getting used to it and just putting yourself in that situation again and again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that I still struggle with. I think... Um, what I found difficult was when I became a tenant, um, I then couldn't, there's something sort of um, like a safety net kind of in a way about being a pupil. And then when people are like, oh, you're a tenant now, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I still don't know what I'm doing though. So, um, there's still, I don't know, it feels like this expectation that when you become a tenant, that that's it, you're, you're fine, you know yeah. everything, um, but it's all still such a learning curve. So that was quite, um, com- difficult but yeah it's something I still I completely still manage com- completely completely identify with that but the, the, the reality of practice at the bar is that you're always working at your kind of the edge of your experience and your um capacity so you're always pushing yourself so you know that it kind of goes in sort of peaks and then levels off so you, you have this incredibly even in pupillage you have this incredibly intense kind of three months where everything's new everything's the first time everything you're freaking out um and it's kind of terrifying and then you kind of come to do it for the third fourth fifth time you think oh okay yeah no I remember how this works and then you get the next set of things which is incredibly new and I don't actually think that ever stops um at every stage the most important thing is that you have other other people at your level and slightly higher than you that it's okay to ask really stupid questions of um ideally people also outside of chambers when you're at that stage where you're being assessed or outside of your firm you really want to be able to go to the toilet and say i'm locked myself in a toilet this has happened i don't want to admit this has happened but can you please help me <laughs> um and you need about i reckon at least five toilet dial lists especially on the <laughs> that's my big tip 100%. and then you just work your way through yeah. them. the first yeah. one doesn't answer right next like yeah yeah, yeah no you, you need have- a good list because like chances are some of them either will be locked in a toilet themselves or mm. in court so you know you need a, you need like a, a, a dial list and whatsapp group so you can shout out for sure I was just about to say that certainly uh, Grace and I, the, the crime yeah. people of the year, we have uh, Crime Pupils 2019 WhatsApp group, which we're all in. Yeah. <laughs> and like you say, it's just hearing it for the first time each time we go through something. Um, and invariably, every day, somebody posts on there saying, well, I'm doing this today. Anybody got any idea what I'm supposed to do? And that support is, is invaluable. So that's a really, really good tip for her to, to bring up. It's also, I think, sorry, jump in again, but it's also really, really important at the, at, so I think now for um, young practitioners, solicitors and barristers now, particularly at the bar, um, so when I 
was very, very first um, getting on my feet. So about the stage you are now, Chloe. Um, it was literally DCS, so digital case working, was just coming in. So I think I had a few weeks or a, a, a few months of actually going into chambers to get my briefs. Um, and then it became digital. And very, very quickly, you didn't see anyone anymore because you get all the old papers digitally. And um, I learnt more in those kind of few months of going into chambers because I'd get my brief, I'd open it and then I'd talk to somebody about it. And it's not necessarily even that I thought I needed help, but just in having those conversations, you pick up little tips and tricks and people go, oh, I've got a skeleton on that. Why not I send it to you? Um, and I think we we have less of those incidental conversations now because everyone's um, you know spread out and, and not. And I, I think we really need to try to get back to talking to each other, talking to our solicitors, you know, um, the, the kind of imposter syndrome, the whole kind of, if you're a barrister, you're, you feel like you're supposed to be an expert. But very often the solicitor that you're working with will be an expert because they've been doing it for longer than you have. And it's frightening to kind of sort of chat to people because you don't want to admit that you don't know what you're doing. But there are ways to kind of, there's a reason people have two lawyers and it's okay to work as a team. I think that's yeah. kind of, that's something that pupils, I think, need to be reassured about. Absolutely. And I think we also forget, having come from a firm, <clears throat> you forget how much your solicitor and your firm know about your client mm. that you don't know. You'll have only met them, you know, maybe on the day, but at the moment we're not, we're meeting them by phone, which is a completely wow. different conference. Um, and I think you forget how invaluable the knowledge is that the police station person or your firm has about your client. I don't know what um, you solicitors, um, trainee solicitors, paralegals think about that, but it's certainly something that as a paralegal, I really got to know my own clients who would come back again and again and again. And of course I couldn't always get the same brief, although I tried, that's, that's not the real world. Um, but a lot of the knowledge that I had about the client was really, really useful. So I think you're right, that, that communication really is invaluable. I mean, so for me, I train and qualify at the same firm. And I've had an opportunity to one specific client comes to mind who I've had a relationship with for, you know, three years. Um, he's a returning client and he's had the same counsel for three years. And although um, you know, counsel now has a brilliant rapport with that, that client. For me, it's so important to have um, counsel who you know you can engage in conversation and discussion, um, both tactically and just somebody who's down to earth and really personable. Because if I would never even consider instructing counsel without that, um, you know, professional, but also friendly relationship where you feel reassured that you can have those conversations where you're just bouncing ideas off each other otherwise you know often I find counsel who you've not instructed before not intimidating um but especially you know somebody's quite junior and I've often got to instruct QCs um it, it's something that's quite scary um and I think now you know two years qualified it's something that I feel a lot more confidence with, and as as Gemma's already mentioned, I think imposter syndrome is a big, a big element of that, and um, just having having confidence in yourself um, to throw ideas and throw your experience out to counsel, and um, I found that that's you know been really positively received. Uh, interestingly, having having worked in a department now where you know you've got partners and senior associates and principal lawyers who um, have been in the, in the company for, you know, 20 years. They have their counsel and they have their chambers that um, they go to. And something that I've experienced through Victor has been able to meet so many, um, you know, female barristers from all sorts of different backgrounds and sets. I think it's really important to you know, develop new relationships, especially as junior members of the, um, in, you know, in criminal law. And I, I've been able to do that and go with recommendations to more senior solicitors saying, listen, I think we need to, you know, approach this set, build new relationships with, with this particular QC or this particular junior, because I think it then allows us to bring strong, you know, stronger relationships within, um, so especially between junior members, because I think there's a definitely a tendency for my firm, for example, to 
instruct, you know, 15, 20 years um, call barristers instead of giving younger um, members or younger junior barristers an opportunity. And I think I'm, I'm, that's definitely something I'm trying to, um, obviously case dependent, um, but it's definitely something I'm trying to um, build and build a, a bigger network, stronger network between us all. Well, like you say, one of the things that I think is really good and has really helped me, albeit slightly intimidating, is um, I'm in one of the Wickle Judicial Mentoring Circles. I don't know how many other people are yet. Um, if you're not, make sure you get in one. Um, but what's really good about that, um, and all credit to the mentoring team, Amy Cox men mentoring team, is that it's step-by-step -step range of roles. So we've got... Um, obviously me as a baby pupil, but then a junior tenant, um, a slightly more senior tenant, a judge, a QC, and a partner in a firm. Um, and just to be able to go out and sit around a table and have a glass of wine and talk about what our weeks have been, what our cases have been, um, how we got into this case or how we got into this role, or there are people in my group that do regulatory work, and that's something I'd be really interested to develop into at some point when it's appropriate in the future. And to be able to pick their brains about how they do that, why they do that, um, is informally, it just takes away that intimidating um, time when you have to try and approach somebody and say, oh, can I just ask you about this? Um, we don't have to just sit around and, and have a glass of wine. It's absolutely lovely to be able to talk to such a wide range of um, other women. And really importantly, it's that safe space outside of chambers because until you become a tenant, you're basically, you're always under some form of assessment. You're always kind of trying to prove yourself in some way or another and so it can be you can have a lot of anxiety about admitting weakness or asking a question which you know or making a mistake um, and if you have a kind of completely external group and especially if you have a relationship and you know it's a forgiving one you're much more likely to be able to ask those questions learn from them and actually be better and those junior tenants are much more likely to then be on my toilet dial list. <laughs> I've got an informal relationship with them. So absolutely, they're the kinds of people you then can ask in those silly moments. Yeah. Could I ask Fee a toilet dial list related question? <laughs> because I wanted to jump in earlier because when Pippa was talking about that anxiety when you're, when you're new on your feet and you're at court and you're thinking, oh my God, what am I doing? Um, I identified with a lot of that from my <laughs> police station rep days because I did police station work for about three years and I don't think I ever got over that. It got easier, but there were still so many times when my phone would ring and they'd say, I've put so-and-so in for attempted murder and firearms. And I think, oh my God, I shouldn't be doing this. This is a, someone, someone else needs to do this. And I know, Fee, you've just started your, uh, your, you've just got your police station, your full accreditation recently. Is that right? Yeah, 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 that's right. Um, yeah, actually, the um, toilet dial list is incredibly relevant, although it tends to be more hallway phone calls, um, not around the officer, so he doesn't have a clue that I'm a little bit unsure about what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's really great, actually. Um, I had a brilliant supervisor helping me through my accreditation, and she made me feel so comfortable that, you know, like, no question's a stupid question. And I knew like essentially everybody that I worked with at the firm were always on speed dial, um, no matter who, um, you know, we've got um, a pretty good communication system within the firm where, you know, if something comes in and someone's going to the police station, we send firm wide email. So a lot of the times, you know, I'll get a text from someone saying, I know you're on your way to the police station to deal with this. You know, I'm up, you know, a lot of the times, you know, you'll be going to the police station at 11, 12 o'clock at night, stupid coffee will say, you know, I'm up, can't sleep for some reason give me a call if, if you get stuck or if you need any help, which is, you know, not even having to ask for the help, but someone saying, I'm here, you know, you can call me whenever, means so much, especially when, as a solicitor, we don't get the same level of advocacy training as you do in your pupillage. And it's the first bit of advocacy I ever did, really, um, you know, if you, if you were to think about it like that and so it's um it is an incredibly nerve-wracking experience um when you're there and you have to make these you know snap judgments on what little disclosure you've got um which could you know inform the rest of the case so it, it, it is intimidating and i've got a brilliant support network in my firm which is really really helpful and i, I definitely do have that speed dial list um for police station related inquiries um, and, and luckily, quite a lot of them tend to be nocturnal. So 
that's always helpful. I think it's a really good point to to say about um, the role of being a police station rep. Um, like you say, either alongside your training contract when you're not doing other advocacy. Um, I certainly did it alongside being a paralegal. Um, and it just gives you that independence to, although it's so frightening to be independent and do it by yourself, it gives you the independence to go and represent a client and sit down and say, do you know what, I, I will represent you. I will try and sort out this sticky wicket that you put yourself into. Um, and to be able to analyse some disclosure and decide what to do with it tactically and make all those sort of decisions that you're going to have to make as a solicitor, as a barrister, later down the line. Um, so I think it was one of the things I, I would really recommend to people to do if you are a trainer, trainee or a you know, future pupil or, or something like that. Um, just to get you up on your feet and, and experiencing those things. It was certainly something that gave me um, some real confidence when I first sat down and looked at a case file when I was prepping mags trials to be able to know what it all meant and, and you know, some of the sort of the tactical considerations you might be making. And then you've got that behind you when you start as a pupil to think, okay, I know what's happened at the police station and I know how we've got to this point procedurally and just some more context is, is really, really useful. Yeah, I agree completely. I think it's some of the best training you can do, whatever path you're taking in the criminal law, you get an opportunity to do it. As this Chloe said, it sort of forces you to get on top of the law because the phone rings and you have no idea you could be dealing with, you know, you could be dealing with a murder, you could be dealing with a possession of cannabis and everything in between. So I think if you get a chance to do it, and it, it sort of forces you to get out of your comfort zone. And it really gives you the feeling of success when you do a really good mm. job and you, you do manage to get them to bin it or you do manage to get them to um, triage a youth or something like that. It gives you some real confidence that actually, okay, well, I'm not going to be able to get them to bin a murder, but I am going to be able to get, get a really good result for somebody that needs a mental health assessment or that needs to be triaged away from the justice system at the moment. So I think it's a, it's a great opportunity if you can get it. And certainly I was very lucky that my firm did it. It was my, my New Year's resolution that year <laughs> was to become accredited by the end of the year. And I went in to the partner and said, come on, this is my New Year goal. Is it possible? And I was very lucky that they said yes. And, and off we went. I think once you start doing that as well and you you build on that confidence, you can then obviously um, just do very basic. I did a very basic first appearance just to build on my advocacy skills um, because it was something obviously I've not done since university, not done since meeting. And I was always one of those people, do I go do my LPC? Do I go do my bar? And it was something that I was really um, passionate about to keep up those advocacy skills. So it's something that I always, you know, if there's a colleague now who, for whatever reason, can't get counsel, which is un unlikely, or if I just, you know, want to put my hand up and go, listen, I'm I'm free, I can I can go. But that happened once, and I had um, a, a DJ, and it was just the most horrific experience. And funny enough, I've not um, volunteered. <laughs> um, but I do do things like pre and post review hearings, which I appreciate isn't. Um, Annie isn't a criminal um it's more more civil procedure but um I don't know Annika what about you have you had any um opportunity to do advocacy at your firm um so no so when you're doing a crime seat you don't really go out and do the advocacy yourself but I've had the opportunity to look at my supervisor doing it in court and I'm so happy to be sitting behind him and not doing it myself um and unfortunately, uh, with my second seat in Civ Libs, because we've got um, the pandemic, <laughs> all the inquests have been adjourned and everything. So I'm hoping to sit in on some telephone hearings instead. But um, I was quite fortunate with my last supervisor. He did ask me to sort of map out like cross-examination and we had like a mock one just between ourselves to see how like you do it. And it was really interesting. And it's really lovely going to court and like seeing other people as well just being on their feet and doing it and I think it's an incredible skill um especially seeing like your colleagues just be told on the morning of oh this one's been remanded you've got to go and deal with it I honestly don't know how people do it and whilst we're all talking about like police station accreditation I'm meant to be doing mine as well and it's definitely a confidence boost but it's so nerve-wracking and it's so nice to know that we're all in this because I remember when I had to go and do like my first run and I was supervised 
I like, I was very silent in offering to go. I was like, mm, I'm very busy today, so I've got work to do. And my supervisor rang me and he was like, you're being awfully quiet. I think we should go and do it. And I was like, mm, no, too busy. And he was like, no, you're going. And I remember being in the car with him and just having to prep it. And it was just nice to just voice out what you were going to do and like how you were going to say it. So I think it's really nice definitely to have like that toilet book list and just have people on speed dial that you can call for support. And um yeah, so I've not had the opportunity to go out and do it myself, but definitely even getting the experience of seeing other people and just like, even if you like get home and make some notes or whatever, just to see what they've done and like, you know, to give you like inspirational ideas for next time is definitely, I'd say, quite useful. It's one of the things I worry about with COVID actually, because one of the big, big things that I, so I do, I do some of the training for getting on their feet for pupils in our chambers. And apart from the toilet dial list, one of the other kind of big tips is to to make sure that you go and just see you know even if you can't go with a member of chambers obviously ideally you'd go with somebody um but you know just go and sit in the back of a mags court Mm -hmm. and i'd say this for solicitors as well um you know just go and see what it's actually like i would really endorse that throughout my first six pupillage um I my supervisor had a was mainly prosecutor and had a really range of practice. So I used to take every opportunity that I could to get myself into the magistrate's court, but also with different tenants. So now as a second six pupil, very new, um and panicking every single time I step foot into Bromley Court because it petrifies me. But I know that I've met and I've spoken to and I've discussed cases with at least about I'd say 10 junior tenants within my set who are all really friendly. And I know that I can ring any one of them and ask a question. So I would really endorse just spreading yourself as best you can to meet and mix and interact with as many people as you can during pupillage or during any training as paralegal as well. I try to do the same. Always tried to get myself to court. Always would beg to go to court rather than sit in the office. <laughs> it was really bad. It, just getting exposure is is really important and I worry about that now with Covid because obviously everything's happening very in very isolated ways I don't know how long this is going to last I don't know if our way of working now is going to shift um, in more permanent sense um, and so I think we as junior people and you know people who are kind of wanting to ke- take care of those coming up behind us need to keep an eye on how we give each other exposure to the kind of work that we're doing even just to see it i think and that sounds like a really simple thing but even to know where the cells are to know where the advocate's room is to know where the cps hide (laughs) to to know those sorts of things to know who to ask for the advocate code room door um you know things like that just to to feel confident when you walk in you think i know where i'm going i don't look lost i know where to put my bag um just the first few times you go it just gives you that sense of confidence that you don't need to worry about what you're doing and how to get started and then you can worry about the courtroom <laughs> more than oh my god is my are my shoes okay i mean have i put my stuff down in the right place where do i find my client those sorts of things i think are just you just solve them by going to watch yeah. certainly not- we had to when i started as a paralegal my supervisor sent me to the mouse school not with anyone just to sit in the gallery and just watch the list for the whole day um and it was the conveyor belt that we all know that it is um but it meant that when i started writing letters i knew what it looked like i could imagine it in my head and so when i was writing to clients i knew what that was i knew what it meant and i wasn't it didn't sound as if i had no idea what was going on it sounded as if i had been there and could write about it great so a lot of people spend their first six kind of doing murders um, with you know brilliant silks, I you know I had an experience, a, 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 you know an amazing experience with you know top QCs when I was a first six pupil going to to into murders, and then I got on my feet, um, and you know tried to deliver this murder closing speech and a theft of a sandwich, and it didn't didn't go very well, and so you know you need to go and see that stuff. So maybe we could have a think about some practical best and worst advice for people who might be watching and thinking, okay, she's a tenant, how do I become a tenant? And that's my question, because that's what I, my next <laughs> thing will be. <laughs> um, so Gemma and Pippa, I don't know whether you could maybe give us some top tips, some best and worst advice for approaching your tenancy milestone. Um, well, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm still questioning the decision to take me on, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just um, just try and it's really hard, but just try and be yourself and just try and 
um, take on all the opportunities to meet members of chambers, whether that's going to seminars that are hosted at chambers or, um, or taking on work for other members of chambers, speaking to your supervisors about, um, you know, other people that you may not have um, met. Maybe sort of just going through the website, seeing who you have met, haven't met. Um, and I think, yeah, just trying to reach as many people as possible so that you get a real feel for who is at your chambers and, and what everyone does. Because I know in, in my set, um, a lot of people do a wide variety um, of different areas and um, our clerks and supervisors are really um, good at sort of getting exposure to different areas. Um, so I do mainly crime, but I've also do family, extradition, um, sort of business crime. There's a whole a host of different stuff that we're all doing, um, which helps build your practice as well. Um, but in terms of tensor, yeah, I think just trying to talk to as many people as possible, particularly the juniors as well. Um, I know it's been said about, you know, the toilet dial list. We have a, a pupils group at Chambers um, where we have basically the last sort of two or three years worth of tenants. We did. And, pupils. Um, and it's for all those really stupid questions that you think are really stupid, but until you ask them, you're not going to know the answer to that question. And, and we're all in the same boat and we've all been there. Um, but yeah, so just, I think, keeping the dialogue open um between you and other members of chambers even if you're worried about things um i know everyone in my chambers has been very understanding if i've you know called them in a panic or um uh, yeah it's just been really nice to have that support yeah totally agree um i i, I think I, I would have broadly three sort of um pieces of advice to move from kind of the pupilage stage to the tenancy stage um one is um say yes to everything and figure out how to do it later um you know and there will be people that will help you and it's okay to say i volunteered to do this thing for this really scary senior member of chambers can you help me um and when you are sort of on that when you're doing work for other members of chambers um ask them for examples of other pieces of work so that you can try and um do it in their style because often when you get feedback from people um, some of it will just be a matter of form and it kind of the impression that your work creates on them um, might just be they like they like footnotes or they don't. But if they get a piece of work that they like the style of, they're much more likely to think it's a good piece of work. Um, so if you can sort of read some stuff they've done before as a practical tip when you're doing work for members of chambers, I would heavily encourage that. Um, in terms of... Um, uh other kind of things to do try to find if if you have time and the reality is that pupillage is exhausting we know that kind of we know that it's all consuming and it's exhausting know that it's not forever but in that time if you if you do have opportunities to do things that are kind of a little bit different chloe for example almost single-handedly running wickle like that will set you apart um you know and if, if there are other, you know, blog posts, little things, if you can be proactive um, and, and just find things to do um, that are kind of a little bit different. Those who are pupils at the moment, I imagine are really frustrated with not being able to get out on your feet. But um, perhaps this is an opportunity to, you know, say, oh, I could write something. What do you think about doing X or what do you think about doing Y? Um, and um, and offer it as an opportunity to a, a tenant in chambers, um, you know, because then they will, it's an opportunity for them to get content out with you doing all the work, but you also build that relationship. Maybe you get your name on it, you know, just look for those opportunities where you can. Um, and um, I did have a third thing, but I can't remember what it was, so I'll shut up. Um, I just had one one more, I just has Please, just yeah. I think it's also really important not to compare your pupillage to someone else's pupillage because every set has a different way of doing things. Some sets um, have two people, some have four people. It's a whole different dynamic um, and the work that you're doing is going to be different. I know I've spent a lot of my time when I was a pupil or um, even as a junior tenant thinking, oh God, maybe I should be doing what that person's doing because they're my peer and, you know, we should, we're around the same call. We should be doing the same kind of work. But the truth is everything is so varied. You can't control, you can't control the work that's going to come your way during pupillage in reality. Um, and you just have to make the best of everything that you have. Um, and, you know, some people, some chambers do things very differently to other chambers. And that may be why you like that chambers or why you don't like that chambers. 
Um, and it's all about sort of finding your fit, I think. Um, so I, yeah, I think just try not to compare um, pupillages sort of side by side because it just, it doesn't work. I think what you said, Gemma, about the fit is a really interesting point too. You know, I obviously I'm not there yet. So it's not an experience I've had, but anecdotally from lots of friends that I've had who are brilliant, brilliant barristers um, and haven't got tenancy at the chambers that they've had pupillage at um, and have, and that's been a real, real struggle. It's been really hard. It's been a real knock. Um, and then they've got third, six pupillages or tenancies eventually at other chambers that have just been the best fit and they, they've slotted in so well. They're flying now, they're doing brilliantly and, and you can see that it, it, it it's the environment, it's the people, yeah. it's the and it's just meant to be for them in a different place. And I think that's something to try and remember. I will be remembering. <laughs> but you know, when you when you do the the tenancy decisions and things like that, the big decisions, um, that it's not necessarily just about you. It can also be about the fit the place, the environment, the other people, there are lots of variables that you can't necessarily control. Yeah, I think it's, you forget that you also have to want to work at that chambers for potentially the rest of your career. Um, and I think you get, you know, when, you, when you're trying to get pupillage, you're like, I reality, I will take pupillage anywhere. I just want pupillage. I want to get into court. I want to be doing that. Um, but then I think when it comes to tenancy, you really have to think about, is this somewhere that I also want to work at um for my career um not just you know do they want me it, it's a two-way process and i think it's hard i you know i definitely didn't think about that when i was trying to get tenancy as much as maybe i should have and um but you know i, I wouldn't change my chambers um for the world and I, I was lucky to have find my fit sort of the first time around um but yeah it really is a two-way street um when you're thinking about your whole career what about um, getting a training contract um, or uh, and finding your traineeship? Um, I don't know the trainees among us, if you can offer some top tips, some best, worst advice, some things that maybe you'd wish you'd known um, and, and how you got into your, your training contracts and when you did them. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll um, try and answer some of those. Um, so I took a slightly longer route. Um, I was reluctant to commit 15 odd grand uh, to doing an LPC straight out of university with, you know, mounting uh, student debt. And so I worked for a little while as a paralegal just to, you know, make sure that I definitely wanted to work in crime. Um, and once I established I couldn't see myself doing any other um, area, then I moved into criminal defence. but. Um, those years working as a paralegal to begin with um, helped me work out from the vast number of criminal law firms what kind of law firm I wanted to join in and what kind of law firm I wanted to have a, a sort of um, career with, um, which helped me identify um, the firm that I'm at at the moment, especially because, you know, they've got a really good um, practice in extradition, which was always my uh, first love of crime. And so I kind of had singled them out as, as one of the few firms that, that had a really great um, reputation in extradition. And I knew I wanted to work there and that I would learn so much else whilst I was there. Um, and, and getting to paralegal there for a year, you do get a feel for the culture of the firm. And, and it helps inform, you know, as much as kind of similar to pupilages, training contracts are like fairy dust. You just want one anywhere, doesn't matter where. But I think it's so important that, you know, if you want to do crime, that, you know, you, you are alive to what working in crime is like before you decide to become a solicitor in it. You know, lots of people just think, oh, I'll, I'll apply for a, a criminal training contract, um, just so I get a training contract, then, you know, off I trot to do, um, you know, tax law. Uh, I, you know, I'm not sure why you'd want to do that, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's really, really important that you want to commit yourself to, to this area. And, um, and it's, you know, it's great if you, if you do manage to do your training contract to a firm that you love, um, it, it makes your training so much better. You're not intimidated to ask questions. If you, you know, if your supervisor says, right, okay, cool. You know, I need you to draft a brief to counsel and you've, you've never done that before. You have, the confidence and the kind of relationship with your supervisor where you can say, well, can you give me some like other briefs that you've done just so I can look at it as like a template, but obviously, you know, the, the offense is completely different. I'll have to look up the law and then have my own crack at it. 
Um, but but if you if you work somewhere where you, you know you feel too intimidated to even ask those kind of questions, you're not going to get the same out of your training than you would do at a, at a firm where you you know it's a lot, a lot more of a supportive culture. Um, so it's really important that you bear that in mind when you're paralegal. And is this somewhere where I want to train? Is it do you, do I think I'll get the best training here? Um, I, I do recommend paralegaling anywhere for six months to a year before you you do complete your training contract with them, just just to make sure that you know that that is somewhere you want to be. Um, it certainly helped me a lot. I don't know how. Sorry. Okay, for it. <laughs> I don't know how I would have personally managed if I hadn't had paralegal experience because I was had my eyes open to almost everything that I could have done as a in a general high street firm and then dealing with different types of clients working in a white collar firm but I just don't know personally how I would have coped and I 100% think if you get pupillage straight through amazing you are brilliant you are one of a kind you are really special but having that foundation for me has really helped me and I, I couldn't recommend it more even if you volunteer I interned and volunteered for years for four years and then I asked for my job as a paralegal because I'd been turned there for so long I felt like I might as well have been a paralegal but it just helped me get where I am today I think 100%. Annika what were you going to tell us about your training contract? Um, well I was going to agree with you guys and say that I think getting as much exposure as possible is definitely key and just offering to do anything and everything because especially as a junior I feel like it's more acceptable to ask these dumb questions and be like, I don't know what I'm doing. Can you just help me? Um, and looking at templates and stuff definitely uh, is great because like you said, uh, people have different styles and just sort of, I had one Fianna, I had two Fiannas, I was working for them at the same time and one of them preferred more information in letters and the other one was like, just keep it plain and simple. And it's just knowing to adapt to which type of person. And then you also find your own style, I think when you're writing letters for yourself and stuff. Um, and it definitely helps build confidence. But my route to a training contract was I did a, a law degree and then I got my job as the crime support paralegal, which is basically like managing like court diaries and police station diaries and also paralegaling for like five other members of the department. Um, and I had done that for about a year or so. And then I'd become a paralegal and I was working for just two partners. But at the same time, I did my LPC part time, which was quite rough, but equally I really enjoyed having the experience of studying and like working. It was really tough to be fair, but just being able to have the exposure of like knowing what you're being taught in class was really beneficial. I found. Um, I think Jess and I are around the same, <coughs> same years of qualification. So we're both two years and we're both uh, associates. So we've both been promoted within those two years. That's right. Isn't it Jess? Yeah. So the only top tip I was going to give was that somebody who's now worked for two years qualified is don't forget to look after yourself. Yeah. Because for me, I know Jess obviously has had a massive change in work culture and all the hours that you have to do um, in an American firm and obviously we work hard to progress. Um, I think now that we are in lockdown and having had an opportunity to reflect on the first two years of of my practice i definitely say don't forget to make time for yourself to do things that are outside of work where you can completely switch off and take as many opportunities to you know engage with organizations such as wickham because without it i think my mental health would be in dire state um and you know don't undervalue um or organizations like this or volunteering or singing in a choir <laughs> you can <laughs> match the two together and sing in the the wickle choir if you like you know because <laughs> <laughs> the cook can help the plug <laughs> um yeah don't don't forget about yourself um because i think i did for a little bit and actually now um Having, having had time to reflect, it's super, super important that you don't put that pressure on yourself um, to, you know, it's so easy as solicitors, as barristers to constantly want to do more, um, to, we're su such ambitious people um, and you don't want that to be to the detriment of, of your health because that's the most important thing. Um, 
that's that's all I would that's all I the main thing I've learned in the last six months for sure on that um it's also actually as well as just being kind of intrinsically true and right and um, I I found I had that same experience of kind of losing yourself in it um and I actually found it for for a while affected actually my practice because and actually both times I took tenancy I um I found that once that hamster wheel had gone and that kind of immediate goal um, sort of fell away, I sort of didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what it was I actually wanted to do, what kind of cases. What, and I'm only really now getting to a point where I'm really loving finding new opportunities again and I've got my kind of motivation and my mojo back and I'm doing really cool stuff that I'm proud of. But I, there was a good sort of year there, I'd say, where I sort of just was in survival mode after I got tenancy. I think it's a really good point to, to um, talk about, although you want to desperately want to get to the next goal, don't forget the bigger picture. I certainly, I was so sort of straight and narrow for attempting to get pupillage, getting pupillage, that once I had got to the point where I was just about to start pupillage, people were saying to me, how do you feel? Are you ready? Are you excited? I hadn't even thought about it because I had so not considered that I would get pupillage, let alone that I would start pupillage, that I hadn't really thought what it would actually amount to in real life to actually do it. And you sort of, you're right, you do forget the bigger picture. So so really sort of um, think about all of those things as well as yourself, Leona, that's a really good point that we definitely forget. Um, has anybody else got a top tip that we haven't addressed, asked, talked about that they wanted to, to say? You know, a lot of people, when they do... Uh, paralegal in between like starting training contracts or doing you know their postgrad you know GDL LPC or bar school they'll usually take three or four months off before they do that I think actually it's a really great idea I wish I had done that I really wish I had done that because now I kind of feel like um, if I stop I'll I'll lose momentum um, and um, you know like you say you get the real anxiety you take time out that you're you're kind of falling behind the law changes so much and so quickly but I think um Certainly in the early stages, uh, if I could give myself a tips or advice um, when I was going through, um, you know, in between jobs and studying was definitely take three or four months out for yourself, you know, go traveling if that's what you want to do um, or, or not, but but definitely take that time out um, towards the beginning if you can, because um, it might not be as easy later. But, you know, I don't know. I'm still quite junior. I could, you know, I might still get the chance to take some some time out in the future, hopefully. I did, so I did um, two years paralegaling. I was only supposed to be there for one, but I loved it so much that I stayed. So I did two years paralegaling, and then I did um, the BPTC full-time for a year. Um, And I, like Annika, thought about doing part-time study, working at the same time, and thought, you know, I I know I want to do it, I know I want to get started, I'm just going to do the year and get it done, and study and get on to the road of actually working. So I did do it full-time, and I think I'm pleased about that, because I did just want to get the study under my belt and and get on with um, working, having spent two years enjoying myself as paralegal. Um, But because I'd taken a whole year out of being in the job, I then decided to go back to paralegaling to get back into the real world and remembering what that was like, remembering what it was like to be with a client in the middle of the night and those sorts of things. Um, and having to have the law at your fingertips, which although you have your study at your fingertips, um, you don't necessarily have crime at your fingertips because we all had to do the white book to death and my brain was largely the white book. Um, but you, And also um, just sort of remembering how to do it, getting back on the bike, if you like. So I did that and then I took a fortnight um the luxury of a fortnight um before I started my pupillage to move house and have a holiday and buy some work clothes and just be you know get all of that sort of nesting for pupillage um done in in the two weeks and I'm really pleased I did that I had some time for myself to get ready for the big the new adventure um but like Fee says I, I didn't take any sort of long extended holiday time which perhaps when the madness starts again I will regret but I think that's you know each to their own on that I didn't take any time I had three weeks um I think I had three weeks off and that was it and I just I wanted to really prepare and make checklists and read Blackstones and do all these wonderful things and actually I just went home I went back to Newcastle and I just spent time with my dogs I spent time with my family I saw my friends because I knew that come October I wasn't going to have that luxury of going home anymore 
And at the moment, I'm in a time where I actually don't know when I'm going to go back to Newcastle, when I'm going to see my mom, and it's terrifying. But just keeping on top of things and just trying to keep busy. And as I've said, as um, Pip said, using the time during lockdown to do things for chambers that you wouldn't necessarily have had time to do if everything was going normally. But also, there's very few lulls that you have during pupillage where you actually don't have as much time as much work to do when you you don't have a deadline set and when you have those moments go to bed early take that time to watch coronation street have a cup of tea and go to bed because that's what i did and i found it sometimes it worked and sometimes it made the day the next day a little bit easier <laughs> yeah mm. absolutely i know certainly um there are several third sixes who i've spoken to who have said i know the lockdown is really strange and we're all working very strangely but i'm enjoying this as a summer holiday and i'm really pleased to have a few days where it's not completely completely manic every day so just to take those days that you can um mm. to to enjoy them and to yourself is a really good tip yeah. i my experience was um so i i only i was really lucky and got pupillage the year that i applied so i only had to to do it once and I applied specifically so that I would have a year between the BPTC and starting pupillage because I knew that I wanted to go and do stuff um, and I um, I went and um, did death row defence work for um, some of that year and then I went to the Cambodia Genocide Tribunal um, and so just had a kind of year doing kind of still legal stuff but also kind of living and working in other countries and I I I cannot recommend that approach enough. It it's it's given me things in my practice now. So I'm now still doing death penalty stuff and and cool cases abroad, which I would never be able to do if I hadn't had that experience. I've got connections in international human rights law that I didn't, wouldn't have, but I also just I value that time in my life as some of the best experiences I've had. And without having had those you know amazing times i'm not sure that i would necessarily have been able to cope as well with some of the darker times um you know all the ups and downs of kind of the stress and the sleepless nights and all of that um and the the, the relentlessness that is that very short period um so i would absolutely 100 percent recommend building in time if you can absolutely. to be honest when i applied for pupillage i didn't realize that my pupillage started in october 2020 <laughs> I thought I'd applied for pupillage that started in October 2021. So I told my bosses in London that I was going to be around for about another year. It's great. I'd get another year of experience and then had to tell them that actually I was going to leave in September. <laughs> so just check when you when your pupillage starts so you can actually plan what you're going to do. <laughs> and we haven't really touched on applying for pupillage. And like you say, Pippa, um, most people will have just gone through that and just um, had their results either way this week. Um and I too, um, amazingly, only had to apply once. But I think that's, I did it so that I was completely and utterly ready. I spent, you know, so long trying to make sure I'd done everything that everybody had ever said to me about ever needing to have on my CV ever, <laughs> you know, and, and trying to get all of my tick boxes done. And um, I and I think it's what they say about um, women applying for silk, women applying for promotion, women applying for judicial appointment. We don't do it until we're absolutely ready. And so the percentages are a bit lower, but then you tend to be, you know, hopefully more successful from that. Um, and I don't know whether anybody um, has any sort of, top tips for people who maybe they haven't got it this year and maybe this year wasn't their year and they sort of need to regroup and start again and, and apply again um anybody would have any top tips for that experience um i would say uh sorry so no. like training contracts i um had applied i got it on my second try basically and i'd asked the first time around uh like just for feedback on why i hadn't got it the first time and they said it was experience they said oh, i'd only been doing the job for like three months so even though it would have been in a year's time they would still want to know what experience i'd gained and i was like fair enough so then the second time when i applied i'd like made a note of all the different things i'd done in that year and was like oh, i can do this i can do that and that i definitely think um gave me that edge for that year round for me to get it that time um so i would definitely Definitely, if you've applied for something, always keep the notes that you've made, like your applications or whatever, or just on the off chance that, you know, you might need to look back at it or whatever. Um, and then just always ask for feedback and just see where what went right, what went wrong, and then use that as like a basis for whatever you need to do next time around. 
I applied for three years to get pupillage and every year was it's horrific there's no other way to explain it it's yeah. absolutely horrible um but what I found is especially when I moved to London people want to help you and people want to give you their time to to see if you can get there so use the people who are around you and ask for feedback on your applications and I had a list of about five people who I would split my applications to and send them to and ask for advice and when I really used that resource I got pupillage so that would be my top tip make friends be nice to people (laughs) get them to look at your applications yeah and I think I, I got it the second time around as well and I think it's just about just keep having faith in yourself just don't um give up it takes a lot of applications also took a lot of applications to get a paralegal job when I was looking for one um it's also really hard to get your foot in the door there um so I think just keep going the the difference I think for me is the second year I applied I'd been a paralegal for a year so I could say yes I you know I've worked in the criminal justice system for this whole year I know what it takes to take a case from the beginning to the end um and I think that really helps. I think it's just trying to build your experience. And as Grace said, um, just using people around you. Uh, the inns also have really great resources for um, mock pupillage interviews and um, application um, days, uh, which I found really helpful. The other thing is that uh, on the, what Gemma was saying earlier about the find your fit, um, mm. are you applying to places that um, are going to be interested in the sort of experience that you have? Um, one of the, the the really valuable things that somebody told me was um, go and look at the profiles of the junior tenants or people that have recently been pupils um, or indeed trainees. Um, you know, how does their CV and the sort of work they've been doing fit with what you've been doing? If, you know, kind of this is a set where, you know, you have to have um, saved a species of whale and you know overthrown a dictator all whilst writing your book then and and actually you've been spending your time on the ground floor paralegaling at a criminal firm is that going to be a good fit um you know both experiences very valuable but you know fight try to find your fit um even when you're looking at the places to apply and when you're looking at your applications and also make sure that you are presenting your experience in a way that's going to speak to those chambers Absolutely. Gillian, what, um, what's it like in terms of getting into the CPS and, and getting a job um, as, a, as a paralegal at the CPS? I find it really difficult. I was in the civil service for three years prior to that. So I worked in family court um, as admin staff and court clerk. Then I went to judicial office um, investigating conduct of judges and other judicial holders. And I tried to get into the CPS for years. So I think I was applying from about 2012. So it took me from 2012 to 2016 to actually get an interview at the CPS. Um, and it, 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 the process is different. It's all competency-based. Um, I know Fiona's probably been there as well. You know, you, you understand the pain. <laughs> um, but once you're in, I think it's... I, I ended up on the appeals unit and I it, was not, it wasn't for me. I would rather have been either on area or in the central casework divisions, which is where I am now, um, where you do get to see your cases from start to finish. You do get to, um, you hold on to that one, which I think is different to area, whereas you can have five or six different cases. So I get to see mine from start to absolute finish, up to sentence and then appeal if if they go for appeal. Um, but it's difficult to get in, definitely difficult. But once you're in, the opportunities are endless. You can, um, I'm now on the prosecutor pathway. So even applying for it, is another whole stage um and you, it, my biggest tips if you are in the cps and you are looking to develop through the prosecutor pathways is definitely pull on the advice of the lawyers on the team because pre- the presentation skills are set, like they will run through mock interviews and everything with you even though you're a paralegal they really want to invest in you um, and they want to keep your skills within the cps so i do think it's definitely beneficial to pull on the advice of others and their experience because otherwise if you don't ask you're never going to get and that's it only if they don't know they can't help you i wonder if anybody has any sort of tips from the work that they've done that's not just crime to talk about how to expand your experience or get into other areas that fall under crime um that perhaps people haven't thought about or might might find interesting in terms of developing their career um into another crime area i was just gonna say um that actually that's something I worried about massively at the beginning of my career um 
you know, having sort of fallen into crime completely accidentally, thinking that I'd never do crime and here I am qualified and really passionate about it. Um, it was something, you know, I, I qualified in quite a niche um, area where I do discipline. So I do general crime, I do discipline, um, I do lots of police law, which then naturally progresses into inquiries and inquests. Um, and I'm lucky that I've got that opportunity within the firm. But I think, you know, that's now led to doing more regulatory work and representing doctors and accountants. And, and I think something that we tend to forget is just because you're, you know, you've got a certain practice in general crime or you tend to find yourself, you know, doing inquests with, but actually all of this is so transferable. And we shouldn't be too harsh on ourselves going, oh my gosh, am I going to be, you know, stuck in doing just this for another 30 years when actually, you know, as proved by Jess, um, it's, your skills are so transferable and you can, you can, um, you know, to transfer and do different opportunities and just say yes to everything, as Pip has already said. And forgive me if this is a silly question, but if you are um, doing a training contract and thinking about a secondment or um, looking to get a secondment, how do you go about doing that? And, and what's the best way to get an interesting secondment that that may sort of lead to different um, work for you to be involved in? I would say networking is a big part of that. Um, and obviously organizations like Wicklow are brilliant for that, but going out and meeting people, um, the more people you meet, you will meet people that have had experience in different practice areas. That's how I ended up doing my supplement when I was a trainee. Um, I went on a night out, my supervisor at the time was friends uh, with, with the woman who, who helped me get that position. And, you know, we just had a glass of wine and we got on really, really well. And, and she gave me her email address and I, I contacted her and she's still now um, a, a real sort of mentor to me and a very close friend. Uh, she's in a completely different area of law to me, she does private client work. Um, and I think it kind of goes back to, uh, I think, sorry, I've got the what Grace was saying earlier. Um, if you just get out there and you're nice to people and you're friendly and you meet people, you will find that it might not happen quickly, but those contacts mm. over time will you know, you'll, you never know what opportunities will come up just through people that you've met who remembered that you were were friendly and enthusiastic and interested in what they were doing. That that applies within chambers as well. I moved. The reason I moved from the one chambers to the other as a tenant was in order to access a greater range of work. Um, so I I now do um, public law, immigration, public law, criminal works, so actions against the police, inquest, that sort of stuff. I like the crossover with particularly I do quite a lot of terrorism work um so the crossover there also with immigration stuff also the criminal deportation side of immigration asylum um and um also do kind of international criminal law and international human rights work and that's all um come from um going and just being keen to senior people in chambers and at these things exactly as you say go and also go and tell the clerks to go and say to the clerks, I'm super interested in doing this. Most of the time, they will be, you know, so excited to have somebody else who wants to cover the really low level, non particularly high paying stuff at the beginning that you want to get experience. So just go and tell people you're interested. Yeah, and I, I definitely agree with Pippa about um, going and speaking to your clerks, having it's really important to have. Uh, from Chambers' perspective, an open dialogue with your clerks. I know mine are really supportive um, and also really keen to get everyone doing a variety of different stuff. And I think um, touching on people, what you said earlier about the sort of void after tenancy, mm -hmm. not really knowing, right, what do I do now? Um, I sort of recently, or sort of just um, before the new year, sat down with my clerks um, to sort of have a think about that and what I've been doing and what maybe other stuff I liked and didn't like. And I sort of, I felt I left that maybe too long. It would have been better maybe to do that earlier. Um, because I was worried about, you know, putting myself out there to say what I liked and what I didn't like. And I'm still not sure what I like and what I don't like. <laughs> um, but I think it's fine to still be in that process. As long as you're having an open dialogue with your clerks, they know when certain things come in. Oh, Gemma might be interested in that. Oh, I'll give her a ring. Let's see. Um, and it's just about them knowing what opportunities you might be open to. Because um, if you don't tell them, they, they can't read your mind and, and you're sitting there going well why am I like that might be quite interesting to do um but that's not their fault because you haven't told them that 
And um, also, they, yeah. if they don't know your experience. So, like, you know, you might have this brilliant, like, pre pupillage experience of having gone and done something weird and wonderful but they don't know that um and so when that kind of really niche case comes up they wouldn't know to send it your way um so yeah absolutely tell people and that's the same for solicitors as well i think because for me i in my second seat i think i i'd say as soon as you're in your second seat you need to be thinking and uh, about qualification which is super scary um and for me, I, I remember I was in a general crime seat in a different office and I just randomly plucked up the courage to email the principal lawyer in the London office who was doing white collar. And I basically said, hello, how are you? I'm doing this in this office. Please can I transfer to London and do white collar crime? And if I, I just think if I'd never done that, I, would, I wouldn't be in London. It was lucky I was able to, to, um, you know, to, to have that opportunity and to have somebody open to um to having me basically and if we don't you know pluck up the courage to make those decisions early on and have a think about where you want to go what specific area you want to do within the firm then um you know your supervisors aren't going to know that you're keen to qualify and stay on and obviously if not then have a look at the market and see what opportunities are out there just think about it sooner rather than later it's what i think this is i don't know if you think the same jess i agree with that completely i think it, it's tough transfer going into a new area at any stage of your career but i think it's tougher the more senior you get just because the more senior you are, the more experienced people expect you to bring to a role. Whereas when you're junior, you can get away with saying, okay, I've never done this, but I've done this, which is sort of similar, and I'm really keen, and, and can I do this? And people are more receptive to that. So, I, I, yeah, I agree with that completely. I think, you know, it's never too late. People, you know, completely change career, you know, or, or like people move practice areas all the time. It can be done. But I think it is harder the more senior that you get. Don't forget that you can also... Um ask for a mentor from Wickle, not necessarily the group mentoring, but um, one-to-one mentors. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the matches that they've put together are really, really good. Um, it would give you someone outside of your chambers, your firm, your organisation to bounce those ideas off. If you're not quite ready, like you say, Gemma, to go to the clerks and say, I'm ready, I want to do this. If you're not quite ready to do that. It's something that you're you're thinking about then by all means you know get a mentor from Wickle and go out and have a coffee and talk about those things that you're you're thinking about moving to or developing into and they may well be somebody that's done it um and learned the lessons or done it and been successful and they'd be able to help you um go into those areas too in the cps i think it's really important that if you're sat in a certain area say extradition or special crime um utilize the job shadowing go and shadow another paralegal go and shadow a lawyer for a week and um, we we do it and we have people come from the business unit and come and sit with us for a week and come and sit in court um i think it's really important to do that just so that it might give you a better knowledge of actually where you might want to be in the cps because once you qualify you go right back to the bottom again and you end up in the bags court we don't get to sit unfortunately in you know the central casework division we have to go right back to the bottom and you know, I hope I am back where I am now as a specialist prosecutor in, you know, five, six years' time, but who knows? But that's for you. you are too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you all so, so much, genuinely, for, for sharing your experiences and, and giving up your time. Um, on a Monday evening, that will be today, when we've posted this, um, we're going to host a junior wickle drop-in surgery and social, so you can, we'll all be there, probably with a glass of wine rather than a cup of coffee knowing all of us um but you can come and and it sounds very grand to say meet us all that's not what i mean <laughs> you can drop in and ask us questions about what we've been talking about um if you have a specific question about a junior milestone that you'd like to reach you can come and talk to any of us um like we've said you know people have helped us and, and it's important that we help the next person in our the down roll from us um which of course we want to do other than that, um, please also make sure that you take part in our Wickle Corona initiative and we're, we're trying desperately to use our online community for good and, and hopefully that seems to have been um, a real success so far. Um, we do have wine tasting this week, which is strictly limited places only, so if you haven't signed up yet, you might want to get in quick. 
Um, but otherwise, um, we really, really hope to see you at our drop-in surgery and social at, I think it's six o'clock on Monday evening, six to 6.45. Um, and you can pop in and just ask a quick question and go, or you can come and stay and have a glass of wine and talk to us about your junior milestone um, or not.